Thank you, comrade. Thank you, Black Rose, Rosa Negra. Thank you, everybody. Uh, as comrade was explaining, I will talk about uh, organized anarchism today. And uh, our objective is to discuss organized anarchism as being advocated by anarchists in different parts of the world. So, as comrade presented me, I'm Felipe Correa, Brazilian researcher, teacher, militant. I coordinate the Institute for Anarchist Theory and History, and I'm, a, I'm also a member of the Libertarian Socialist Organization, OSL, in Portuguese. So, uh, when we talk about organized anarchism, in fact, uh, this is an issue that could be discussed by different perspectives. And that's what I would like to do today with you, is to discuss organized anarchism uh, from a global history approach, from a contemporary anarchist approach, and also to discuss some examples or specifically three historical examples of this homogeneous organizational dualism and to extract from these experiences some lessons that could guide the anarchist militancy today. So this will be interesting for people who are looking for uh, elements for militancy and also for people who would like to know what is this organized anarchism. So, uh, to talk on a global history approach, we could say based on my book, Black Flag Discussion Anarchism, that uh, makes a global historical political theory of anarchism based on 150 years uh, of anarchist history throughout the whole world. That organization is uh, something important when we talk about anarchism. Okay, uh, on this book, I define anarchism as a libertarian form of revolutionary socialism based on three main axes. The first one, a critic of domination in general, class domination, exploitation, but also nationality, gender, and race. And so anarchism has a huge history of critic to capitalism, state, imperialism, patriarchy, and racism. The second axe, the defense of self-management. And so a defense, an objective, of uh, general socialization or socialization of private property, but also socialization of political power, the end of social classes and domination in general. And third, uh, a strategy of revolutionary and anti-authoritarian social transformation, basically transforming the system of domination we live in, capitalism, statism, into a system of self-management. On this discussion, uh, when we analyze anarchism globally, we see that uh, there are three major debates and divergences uh, among anarchists. And these three huge debates is about organization, reforms, and violence. So the answer for these issues, for these debates, is uh, on the base to establish uh, the anarchist currents. Basically, uh, when we see anarchist positions concerning organization, we will find three answers. We can find anarchists that are contrary to organization in general. We can find those that defend small or informal groups or collectives, and that's, uh, that involves 
some level of organization. And then we find those who are favorable to organization. And then uh, these anarchists are frequently called organizationists. We will focus today <clears throat> exactly on this organization debate and to understand the positions of these anarchists that uh, were and are favorable to organization or the organizationists. When we say uh, we have and we had anarchists defending organization, we could ask which form of organization were they defending? And the majority defended the mass syndicalist organizations like the Argentinian Fora that is in the picture below. So these anarchists helped to develop the syndicalist movement and organized inside the syndicalist movements as syndicalists. But a minority chose organizational dualism that is basically a form of organization that uh, works with two levels of organization. First one, the level of the anarchist specific organization. And the second one, the popular mass movement. Or anarchists organize at the same time as anarchists in the political anarchist organization and as workers in the popular mass movements. And when discussing the model of the anarchist specific organization, we find in history two main uh, models. What I'm calling here a heterogeneous model or the synthesis model that normally is based on a pluralism of positions, so different conceptions of anarchism, different conceptions of strategy, tactics, and so on. And we have also the homogeneous model, and we have the historical experiences of platformism, specifismo, and others. And this second model is characterized by the unity of positions. So uh, a unitarian position on anarchism, strategy, and so on. So uh, this heterogeneous model was defended by anarchists like Max Netlau, Emma Goldman, Sebastian Fourre, Volling, by the Spanish FI, by the Argentinian FLA, by the international IFA or IFA. And this homogeneous model was defended by Bakunin and the Alliance, the Giello Truda group and the platform, the platformists, and also by the Uruguayan Anarchist Federation and some contemporary initiatives like the Anarchismo Network. So our first uh, answer is that in a global history approach, we could say that uh, organized anarchism include all those that defended organization or those organizationists. And here we include revolutionary syndicalists, anarcho-syndicalists, organizational dualists, including synthesists, platformists, specifistas, and so on. So uh, I put here some of uh, important historical anarchists that defended this organized perspective inside anarchism. But uh, when we are talking on the contemporary anarchist approach, we will find uh, two different ways to understand what organized anarchism means. A broader one, close to this global history approach that refers to the anarchists that uh, some way or other defend the organization in general, or more precisely, the anarchists that uh, defend the specific anarchist organization. But we have also a more restricted, restricted uh, form to see, 
what is organized anarchism. That uh, refers to the anarchist defense of a more limited set of historical positions. Anarchists, anarchists that sure uh, defends anarchism, defends organization, but inside the organizational debate defends the organizational dualism and also this homogeneous model of anarchist specific organization. And from the 1980s, 1990s onward, uh, specificists and platformists, especially by the influence of Uruguayan Anarchist Federation and South America organization, is using organized anarchism to refer to this uh, specificists, platformists, or, or what I'm calling here this homogeneous organizational dualist perspective. So, what we will do now is to understand better this tradition, what I'm calling homogeneous organizational dualism. From a historical perspective, we could say that uh, there is a continuity between the anarchist tradition initiated by Bakunin and the Alliance and later experiences like the platform, platformism, and also specifism. And I said earlier, uh, this tradition defends at the same time organizational dualism and this homogeneous model of anarchist organization. And there are contributions in terms of history and theory of this anarchist tradition, which I will discuss now with you. I will start with Bakunin and the Alliance. On this picture, you will see Bakunin at the center with, with some comrades of the Alliance. The Alliance uh, was formed in a context of uh, advancement of capitalism, state, statism in Western Europe and a context of uh, increasing social conflicts, class conflicts, national conflicts, and others. And there are uh, an element really important that is the formation of the International Workings Man Association, the first international in 1864, that uh, consisted in an initiative that unite proletarians, workers from different countries to face the developments of capitalism, of this new society that were being formed. And uh, inside the international, there was always a dispute between federalists and centralists. And these federalists, since the beginning, 1864, up to uh, 67, 68, uh, these federalists were first uh, Proudhonians, mutualists, and then this changed. So this feud uh, was radicalized uh, just as the international, and then it appeared uh, a current called the collectivists that uh, kind of substituted this hegemony of uh, the mutualists when facing the centralist current. And this change was about uh, 1868, 1869, okay? The, the Basel Congress of the International of 1869 was fully determined by the collectivists. The Alliance was funded on this context and it's interesting to say that Alliance had a public body, a public section, and also a secret session. And the organization was funded in 1868 to reinforce this collectivist feud inside international. And it's interesting to see that the history of the public alliance is best known, but not well known 
but that of the secret alliance is little known or even denied, including by anarchists. I don't know uh, if this is the case in the United States, but uh, there are lots of countries that Bakunin uh, was transformed in a kind of uh, a not uh, so uh, easy anarchist. So lots of people with uh, points uh, accusing him to be authoritarian and some other, some other stuff. Uh, affirmations that, uh, in fact, uh, I discuss in my book, like 90% of them are false. So we could say that Alliance was the first anarchist organization in history. So it was a political organization, an anarchist organization with a mass orientation close to syndicalism. And then uh, this mass orientation was promoted by alliance members inside international. An alliance was formed basically by two sectors. The first one of educated revolutionaries that participated in the springtime of the peoples and uh, that broke with the League of Peace and Freedom and then joined the international. Another part of the alliance was formed by workers who were already part of the international, many of them in the union movement. The Alliance got presents in Switzerland, Spain, Italy, France, Portugal, and Russia. Its main achievements are the creation of the international where it did not, did not exist. So contrary to Marx's affirmations, Alliance, uh, didn't want to destroy the international uh, alliance was uh, the alliance was uh, responsible to create the international in different places and then to create uh, new sections and to strengthen the sections where the international already existed the alliance also acted with propaganda in newspapers of the labor movement. It had uh, some influence in Latin America, basically in Uruguay. And it was, like I told, the hegemonic force in the international from 1869 on, and also in the anti-authoritarian international from 1872 onwards. Its members participated in the Lyon Commune of 1870 in France that uh, was a bit, um, uh, the, the Paris Commune was just after that. And also the Bologna insurrection of 1864 on Italy. After the death of Bakunin, Bakunin uh, was dead in 1876. The alliance and this Bakuninist or Bakuninian tradition uh, influenced some important anarchists like Malatesta and Kropotkin. But the subject of the alliance became a kind of a forbidden subject, even among anarchists. And there are some reasons for this. Bakunin asked uh, Guillaume and others to keep this in secret. Uh, anarchists start to deny the existence of the alliance to uh, object Marx's positions to the Hague Congress and the expulsion of Bakunin and Guillaume on 1872. And uh, as I was saying, Bakunin uh, produced a certain shame of a more strongly organized anarchism. There was <clears throat> liberal and Marxists talking a lot of bullshit about Bakuni, and I talk about that in my book. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of anarchists uh, believe that in some way. But I think recently, after the publication of Bakuni Complete Works that uh, occurred in 2000, by the Amsterdam International Institute, there is being a continuation to 
of effort to reconstruct this history. And then uh, Bakuni has a lot to, to talk to us. His experiences, his writings uh, um, are incredible. And I invite everybody to, to know his history, to know his theory. He was not just a man of action, as said. He has important contributions in the field of uh, political theory and so on. So uh, the second example we will examine is the Diallo Truda Group magazine, the platform and the platformist tradition. So uh, in the middle, you can see the, the first page of the edition that uh, started to publish the platform. We got this uh, uh, in our researches. And then you can see four authors of the platform. The context uh, of the publication of Platform and Giello Truda is a context uh, exactly after the defeat of anarchists in the Ukrainian revolution that uh, is, as you know, a kind of uh, a revolution that has started inside Russian revolution of 1970. So the Ukrainian revolution went on from 1918 to 1921. And uh, there was an important anarchist leadership in the revolution, especially by what, it, what was called Maknovicina. And the uh, Maknovicina had to, uh, had to conflict with different enemies, Austro-Germans, whites, nationalists and after Bolsheviks. And the defeat of the libertarian project, uh, in fact, is explained uh, by military problems, by organizational uh, insufficiencies, and also Bolshevik betrayal and repressions. But the fact is that uh, Makinovists faced a lot of deaths, arrests, and some of them went into exile. And some of them in France, like Makno and Arshinov, and some others, allies, published from 1925 onwards a magazine that was called Giello Truda. And among other subjects, they were interested to reflect uh, why did we lose the revolution? And what is going on with anarchism? And we can say that the organizational platform of the General Union of Anarchists that was published in 1926 is uh, some kind of criticism, of self-criticism, and also uh, some proposals to reinforce the anarchist project. So the platform also motivated a huge debate on anarchist organization. As I research, I could say that uh, this was the biggest debate on anarchist political organization that uh, went on and then uh, started with the publication of the platform and then we had like uh, lots of interventions, almost 30, uh, up to the mid of 30. So it motivated uh, a debate of almost 10 years, but negative reviews and rejections predominated. Okay. For many, uh, certainly uninformed because uh, some evaluations kind of crazy and have no uh, based in reality, but uh, they saw platform as a project to Bolshevize anarchism or to bring some influences of, of Bolshevism to anarchism. And surely uh, these people 
didn't know Bakunin, his history, his writings, because I can affirm, I'm sure that everything that is in the platform is in Bakunin. And so there is no way to understand the platform as a, as a, a way to Bolshevize anarchism or to build something like something like that. So what is real is that a uh, platform had a small influence on mainstream European anarchism. Its biggest influences, okay, I put the name of the organizations in each country, but it's important to say that it's not a huge influence. This is a, a not very significant influence. The main one in Bulgaria, I think uh, maybe this is the most interesting experience influenced by the platform of the Federation of Anarchist Communists of Bulgaria. Uh, an experience uh, that went from the 1920s to, to 1940s, and it's really interesting. But uh, the platform had also some important impact on France and Italy and some different organizations from the 1920s up to the 50s. And also, uh, and also in this attempt to create a libertarian communist international in the 50s that uh, was carried on by organization, Organisation Pensée Bataille uh, of France, and also the um, Gruppi Anarchice de Azione Proletaria uh, of Italy. So, this was uh, a first wave of influence. What is different is that uh, from the 80s and 90s, platform uh, had a new wave of influence in the world. So uh, on the 80s and 90s, we have organizations being funded and being built influenced by the platform on Ireland, on Italy, on South Africa. And this document arrive, arrives at uh, Latin America in the second half of the 90s. Two important uh, influences that this document had was in Chile, we had the Congreso de Unificación Anarco-Comunista, and this was a, a, a central document to, to, to this process that uh, had impact on organizations that uh, was constituted after this Congress. And also the dissemination of the document in Brazil and the influence that this document uh, had on specifismo. You see here on this image, it's written Anarchia and Organização. This was the, the first book that published the platform in Brazil. Third experience, uh, Uruguayan Anarchist Federation and specifismo. Here on this images, we have a lot of things, but uh, basically uh, we have some foul militants that was murdered by the dictatorship. We have uh, the original uh, the original document called Cope that discussed the uh, armed struggle and some CNT uh, demonstration and some other stuff that uh, are explained below. The Uruguayan Anarchist Federation was funded in 1956 to articulate Uruguayan anarchists politically. It starts to function, but uh, in 63, 64, it occurred I split basically because the Cuban revolution that, as you know, 
occurred in 1969 and had a huge impact on Latin America, but also on issues of political strategy. So basically after 64, the organization became more homogeneous, uh, more um, united and uh, built a common strategy, a common program up to 73. So we could say that historically from 64 to 73, it's the period of construction of what we call a specifismo today, okay? The term for you in English, uh, I think could be translated at, as uh, specifist, and this specifist is because of a specific anarchist organization, okay? So specifismo is the name in Spanish and in Portuguese, and so we use this in Latin America. This tradition was built, being influenced by Bakunin, by Malatesta, by syndicalists, by the expropriators that we have here in Latin America. But it's important to say that the term specifismo was already used in Latin America, meaning defense of anarchist specific organization. So it's important to say that uh, it was not the European Anarchist Federation that invented this term, but from 64 to 73, what FAO uh, made was then redefine the meaning of this term by its theory and practice. And I will talk about this theory and practice now. The context uh, of Uruguay on that time, on 60s and 70s, was a context of huge economic crisis and hardening of the political regime which would culminate in the military coup and dictatorship from 1973 onwards. From this time, uh, we would note an escalation of social conflicts at all levels, in unions, on communities, among students, and so on. And the Tupamaros, Movimento de Libertación Nacional, started uh, to participate on these conflicts basically by an armed struggle influenced by Cuban folkismo. On 64, uh, we could see the unification of the trade union movement and the funding of the Convención Nacional de Trabajadores, National Convention of Workers. And look at the letters C and T. Okay, despite this process was uh, had the hegemony of the Communist Party with this reformist uh, Soviet Union line at that time. If you remember uh, the importance of the Cuban Revolution on Latin America was exactly because this uh, questioned putting to a crisis, this reformist line that was being promoted by communist parties in different parts of the world. But the anarchist uh, federation had uh, an important participation. So the name of the of the of the trade union movement of the of the central union uh, was influenced by the fall. And as I will talk to you, FAO had a great influence on this uh, process, despite the Communist Party influence. In 1967, uh, the political regime started to close even more. And on 67, all revolutionary left organizations uh, were declared illegal including FAO. So for you to have an idea, every organization of the revolutionary field was declared illegal, but not the, the communist party that had this, uh, this uh, position 
of not uh, confronting the, the, the capitalist system, not confronting the political regime and so on. And so uh, from 68 to 73, situation become quite complicated and conflict uh, start to develop in, a, in another level. And this was important to motivate the, the coup, the military coup, the dictatorship and everything that is started in 73. Uh, on his history, Fau, was the only left-wing organization that worked at the same time with the mass sector and an armed sector. FAO was the second force in the armed struggle through the Organización Popular Revolucionaria 33 Orientales or Revolutionary Popular Organization 33 Orientals or I don't know exactly how to translate OPR 33, and uh, this was the armed sector of the organization, and it was acting together with other left-wing sectors as Tupamaros, but at the same time opposing Tupamaros' line of uh, the Cuban folkism, as I said, influenced by Cuban revolution. And FAO was also the second force in the mass struggle to this uh, groupment called Tendencia Combativa, Combative Tendency, uh, in the CNT, and also other organizations where FAO had uh, protagonism, like uh, Resistencia Obrero Estudantil, ROI, and Frente Estudantil Revolucionaria. And on the mass level, the main dispute was with uh, the Communist Party reformism. So it was kind of a divided field, the armed struggle and the mass struggle. Tupamaro was acting just in this armed struggle and the Communist Party was acting just in mass, uh, in mass uh, struggle. So the challenge for FAO was to act on this two fields to create a strategy to put these two sectors in the same uh, program, in the same strategy, and to promote uh, a revolutionary perspective by these two sectors. FAO uh, was a relevant political actor whose practice was prominent on Uruguayan left, so you will find uh, on Uruguay history important participation on strikes, mobilizations, kidnappings, and so on. But also, for, uh, despite uh, we had almost no researchers in FAO, FAO was uh, uh, a big organization, but composed uh, mainly by workers like uh, Mechoso, for example, that uh, uh, studied up to 12 or 13 years old and lived in peripheries and so on. But uh, despite that, uh, FAO had a really interesting theoretical production, uh, including subjects related to armed and mass struggle, anti-imperialism and so on. We, we translated and are translating some issues uh, written and published by FAO on that time. But <clears throat> the end of the first period of this organization is not a, 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 an interesting end, you know. Uh, FAO had to deal with a lot of prisons, a lot of tortured members, uh, some of them went into exile to Argentina, but three years after, Argentina also had a military coup in 76, and this uh, killed a lot of other militants. So we could say that uh, FAO lost dozens of militants on Uruguay, on Argentina, and the military coups on these two countries help us to explain 
the end of organization's first period. So uh, if you are interested, I could uh, give some tips after of books that can uh, discuss this histories, this trajectories of Bakunin and the Alliance, of the Gielotruda platform, platformists, and also um, FAO, because I know this is not uh, well known. Now we are trying to, to translate things, we are trying to publish things, and uh, I know that I just gave some small tips, but uh, if you want, I can indicate like uh, bibliography for you to references for you to have more access to these histories. Okay, so uh, this is the last part of my presentations that I compiled some lessons of these experiences that is being used to for uh, by anarchists in different part of the world, okay, uh, in the uh, specifistas, in the platformists organizations, you will find a lot of these principles going on. So, uh, first thing we could apprehend from these experiences is to work with some general organizational principles that could be used in political anarchist level organizations or social mass level or organizations. The principle of social force or to transform the capacity we will find on people, on workers and so on into a social force, okay, to make them transform this potential into a real force to intervene on reality and at the same time to search for a dispute and to make the anarchist project a winner project okay we're calling this power we can discuss that okay to enhance an anti-authoritarian influence on popular movements and to follow a libertarian anti-authoritarian social transformation in all fields Another principle is self-management or federalism. Uh, we mean by that uh, organization without domination and hierarchy between members and levels. So we do not agree with some forms of uh, organization that we have people dominating other or uh, political organization or party dominating social popular movements, unions, and so on. And uh, then this means also democratic grassroots decisions. And uh, finally, uh, we are working with this idea to create the new society within the shell of the old S. Uh, when we have the comma here, uh, these are phrases, these are expressions used historically by anarchists, organizations, and so on. After we could say something about the conception of anarchist political organization, and uh, all these experiences worked with this active minority organization, okay, organization that you will have commitment of members, discipline, responsibility, theoretical and ideological unity, strategic and tactical unity. And this unity does not involve consensus all the time. So uh, if you see the alliance, if you see the platform, the platformists, the specifists and so on, you will find a common method that is try to reach consensus at the first time when you have uh, differences, there is no problem in voting and you have uh, you can have criteria of two third for some important issues, simple majority to some other simple simple issues. The work on different uh, social fronts, okay so, 
uh, they work in unions, on community movements, uh, students' movements, agrarian movements, and so on. Work on different themes like nationality, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, environmentalism. And when working with that, always with the class struggle perspective and to work at different levels. I have here a, a phrase that uh, was spread too much by FAO, and they called that direct actions at all levels. The idea of concentric circles, we will find that uh, on Bakunin, Alliance, Platform, and FAO, and so on, a condition for different people to participate, different kind of membership, and a correspondence between right and duties. Or if you can commit with the organization, you will participate in the decision-making power. This is to solve some autonomist problem that people uh, come and go and start taking decisions for others to execute. So the concentric circles uh, articulate rights and duties and people have a, a common ground on commitment and decision-making power. The activities of the anarchist organization can be summed as social work and insertion, production and reproduction of theory, anarchist propaganda, political training, conception and implementation of strategy, political and social relations, research manage management, and so on. The general goals of the anarchist organization is to engage in everyday conflicts, to influence social struggles and popular movement, to strengthen the creation and empowerment of grassroots popular movements. And here we have the idea of the anarchist organization as a small and giant to unite this movement and to strengthen a self-managed popular power project or some final objectives that are revolutionary, that are socialist, that are libertarian. And when we talk about this mass orientation and or like we say here in South America, our conception of popular power, we can see uh, some issues that are really important as lessons uh, understood and apprehended of this experience. And I will now talk about that. Anarchist organizations should promote a mass orientation or strategy. And here we see in the Alliance on Platform, Specifismo, this strategy, this mass orientation, has uh, really a close. Um, it, it, this strategy is really close to historical strategy of syndicalism, of revolutionary syndicalism, anarcho syndicalism. And that means to build a self managed form of popular power power that is fully achieved when oppressed classes or workers, peasants, uh, marginalized, and so on, impose their force on the dominant classes. This is what we're, we're calling social revolution. Those who make the revolution are the popular masses and not the political organization or party. When we see and when we compare the Leninist proposal with this tradition proposal, we can identify some differences. Okay, first difference, the way organization operates internally because it's a federalist, it's a self-managed uh, organization, this anarchist organization. This is something different of uh, the democratic centralism. But there is also another difference that is the relationship between the political organization and the popular organization. Okay, the organization that should 
that must do revolution are mass organizations and the anarchist organizations should be there inside, strengthen this mass organizations. Or uh, we say that uh, this is a project of creating a strong people here in South America. To build the revolutionary revolutionary subject in the process of struggle. Okay, but popular power must begin to be built immediately. How can we do that? We can uh, start that organization or, or, or organization and working on the organization of movement where there is no popular organization by participate participating in existing movements but in both cases it's not enough to be there it's not enough to boot a movement to organize people you have to be there organized you have to be there to promote a specific program or a strategy that i will now explain to you as the closing part of my presentation okay what is this popular power project what is this mass orientation project uh, these anarchists defend to strengthen grassroots organization in all sectors so by place of work by place of living by place of study and so on to guarantee the strength, the force, and the protagonism of workers. Do not subordinate movements to political or ideological positions. So this proposal was Bakunin's proposal, was Platform's proposals, was Faust's proposals, has to be that uh, it's not necessary or it's not uh, interesting to create anarchists union anarchist popular movements anarchists have to be there inside huge movements mass movements movements with other political forces to uh, build this project and so it's important to strive on these movements for class independence in relation to all kind of institutions and people that can exercise relationship of domination, bosses, the state, political parties, churches, NGOs, and so on. Or these traditions uh, explain us that all help is welcome, but not to substitute the struggles. It's important to cultivate permanently class solidarity to avoid mobility individual or sexual mobility and to focus mainly on structural and revolutionary transformation of society to strengthen social struggles and achievement through combative mobilization and the short-term achievements here we could say that uh it's are important to be advanced toward transformative and revolutionary perspectives to confront the state through popular movements what is called normally what's what is normally called direct action and to do our politics in workers own bodies let's remember what classical anarchists uh, explained to us that uh, the state is an institution of the ruling classes and the state produces the bureaucracy, the social class. So we do not want to transform ourselves into bureaucrats. And uh, finally, to guarantee protagonism of workers with the decisions being made at grassroots level with workers being empowered with the struggles being built as a space for creation of a new revolutionary subject and the new society and we have to know that the subject is not created automatically by inequalities by the structure not even for the vanguard 
let's remember that submission generates an incapable subject. It's in this complementary relationship between political organization and popular movements that it is possible to promote the creation of popular power and move towards a revolutionary transformation of society. I would like to dedicate this presentation to Juan Carlos Mechoso. It's a founding member of the FAO and was part of the FAO up to his death. And he died in 2022. He was part of the OPR 33. He was syndicalist. So I dedicate this presentation to him. Thank you very much, and I wait your question. Thank you. 